Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Onco Daily. And it's again uh, Onco Influencers, our series, and we have we are honored today to have Dr. Nagashri Sitarambu from the United States with us, and from the Northwell Health in New York. Dr. Nagashri is a thoracic and uh, head and neck oncologist at Donald and Barbara uh, Zucker School of Medicine at Northwell Health. Uh, and she is a board certified in internal medicine, hematology, oncology, and hospice medicine palliative care. She is the director of thoracic and head and neck medical oncology and holds other key positions at Northwell Health. At a national level, she serves on cancer prevention, healthcare disparities, and respiratory committees of Alliance Oncology for Clinical Research, publications and mentorship committees of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, as well as Endocrine Cancer Committee of American Head and Neck Society. She has been a speaker at various regional and national meetings and, it's the uh, and is the principal investigator for multiple clinical trials. She has innumerable peer-reviewed publication, is on the editorial board of uh, peer-reviewed journals and serves as an ad hoc reviewer for a multitude of impactful journals. Uh, she is the editor-in-chief of AME Case Reports Journal, and we are proud to have her also on the editorial board of the Onco Daily. She is also an educator, is an associate program director for hematology and oncology fellowship program at Norsell Health and serves on the ASCO Virtual Mentorship Committee. Uh, thank you again for joining us and welcome again. And thank you, you so have much for having me. Thank you, thank you. You have accomplished a lot. And how was your career trajectory? Please, can you share with us? Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, this invitation and for your very generous introduction. Um, it's um, it's an honor to be here, by the way. But uh, uh, in terms of my journey, it has been a very long journey, very circuitous path to where I am here today. And I do want to say that every step of the way, I've learned so much and I cherish every moment of my academic career. So I grew up in India. I went to medical school um, at Government Medical College, uh, Berlari, which is now called Vijayanagar Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, I uh, then decided to um, do a, a residency in pediatrics. So I went to Karnataka Medical College, uh, also a government-led medical college uh, in Hubli, also in India. Uh, I was working subsequently as a pediatrician. Uh, I wanted to be a neonatologist. So some of my very early publications are in neonatology. Uh, during that process, during the residency, I did get exposed to um, the field of oncology. At that time um, in India, it was really, you know, it was uh, the field itself was in its infancy. So there were very few providers. So when I spent the time with them, some of them were really seeing pediatric as well as adult patients. Um, and uh, in that center, I came across, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, patients suffering from, uh, let's say, from uh, leukemias to solid tumor malignancies. And it was such a fascinating field. I, I, you know, immediately knew that this was where the energy needs to be put in, um, a lot of effort into, because it was at that point, you know, almost like everyone who was diagnosed with cancer, um, you know, had to go through a very um, uh, morbid process um, with very few patients actually surviving it. So, so that, you know, I kind of decided that that was going to be my future path and then came an opportunity to come here to the U S. So one thing I had not had experience in, I, of course, you know, it's a very hands-on experience um, in India I had, um, um, you know, like, uh, with regards to patient care and with regards to um, communication skills, we were uh, quite comfortable with all of that. But one thing I did not have 
an opportunity at that time was um, in research, especially, you know, lab-based research. So when I came here, I spent about a year in um, nephrology transplant lab, learning about PCR um, techniques and you know, uh, in a multiple, you know, extracting the RNA, DNA, um, a flow cytometry, you know, multiple techniques. And that led the foundation for me to understand uh, the pathways and, and kind of, you know, as I moved forward, that still, I remember those uh, days and it kind of, kind of helped me understand, you know, scientific papers as I read them along. Um, then I started my residency at um, Long Island Jewish Hospital, um, where, again, I was blessed with great mentors and I was able to do some lab-based research project as a very busy resident, but also I got um, mentored by people like Dr. Kanti Rai, who is, you know, the a world-renowned um, hematologist um, who, who is, whose name is associated with the Rai classification and many other mentors. So my interest in oncology kind of, you know, like I knew that this was what I, I was going to be doing all my life. Um, uh, I did my fellowship at NYU, um, hematology and oncology, and again, blessed with great mentors. At that point, I decided that it was going to be thoracic and head and neck that I was going to do. Uh, we, uh, as part of NYU training, we spent a lot of time at Bellevue uh, Hospital, which is uh, a city hospital. Many of our patients have, um, you know, it's a socioeconomically uh, they are very different than in private centers. So um, gave an opportunity to the diversity and disparities in medical care, but also um, the type of patients that I saw, a lot of them were um, head and neck and thoracic. And, and those were the fields at that time that needed the most attention. Uh, for head and neck, I you know it's it's a still a very morbid treatment process. Um, they need a lot of uh, patient focused, uh, you know, communication focused uh, discussions. Uh, lung cancer, on the other hand, um, very rapidly progressing uh, discoveries, and um, it's really to be in the middle of science. I think it's it's a great field. So I thought the balance was just about ideal. So um, I decided to go on um, that path. There were some commonalities, you know, sometimes the. Uh, patient characteristics are some, some, uh, somewhat similar uh, to these cancers. And a lot of times patients, uh, uh, head, head and neck cancer survivors uh, do get lung cancer subsequently. So there will be a continuum. So that's why I decided to kind of keep both of those, um, um, you know, uh, cancers as active uh, areas of both clinical care and research. Um, I spent about five years at uh, NYU before as faculty before I moved to um, Northwell Health. So it has been a very long journey, but a very, very, very gratifying experience all through. Um, I, here, I, um, uh, as, um, as was mentioned, I do uh, lead the head and neck and uh, thoracic group. Um, I am passionate about um, um, mentorship and bringing the new generation of oncologists um, to um, to the world of oncology, and uh, it not, nothing gives me greater pride than seeing my mentees excel in their fields. And many are actually thought leaders. And in fact, the way I got attracted to Anko Daily was by seeing that some of my mentees were mentioned um, in the top one hundred list. So that's a very gratifying experience. Um, so that's where I am today. And I'm um, you know apologize for the very very long story about myself. Well, thank you very much. It's really very impressive and very, very nice journey starting from the uh, from uh, India Medical School in India and coming to one of the top institutions uh, and I mean, uh, getting leading positions there. It's really, I think, a very uh, impressive career path and uh, I'm sure a lot of people will, will get motivated with your career path. So uh, some of the questions I was going to ask you already answered during your your uh, uh, speech, but but still, I mean, talking about mentors, uh, what's mentorship for you? 
what's the most important in the mentorship for you and yeah uh, what's the role of mentorship in your opinion in not only in oncology but in the medicine well i i think you know you, we need mentors whether you're an administrative you're you know even non-medical fields i think mentorship is extremely important um People have already gone through this path. There's already a path that has been carved. So, you know, um, it is very important to learn that path so that we can build on that and move further, right? Um, I really um, like the analogy of, um, I don't know if you've seen this uh, picture where, you know, there's this push and pull technique where, you know, there's one person pushing the other one off, you know, uh, onto a cliff while pulling another one uh, from below so that everyone gets to the top. Um, so that's that's something that I really um, um, appreciate. You know, that's, that's where it should be. While I am, you know, uh, getting, you know, what, uh, during my entire journey, as I mentioned, I've learned so much from every mentor. I've imbibed their sl uh, uh, styles. I've taken the things that actually... Uh, um, feel impactful to me um, and worked on something that I felt as weaknesses in my mentors um, so that I don't do the same thing. So it, that that has been very helpful in terms of, you know, um, getting projects and in, in terms of uh, getting ideas. Uh, it is extremely important to to have a great mentor who not only, you know, um, uh, tells you what to do, but also takes you in and takes your ideas and then helps you build on them so that you can have that ownership of your, of the ideas, but at the same time, you're not doing it wrong. So that's what a mentor is to me. It's a real colleague, a friend, a well-wisher who uh, works with you as you uh, continue on your, uh, on your journey forward. In, you know, to be honest, I think not only have I learned from my mentors, but I've also learned from my mentees, I every time I interact with them, I learn so much. So it's still an, a, a learning process. That learning will never end. I learn from them. I mean, you know, there are, um, for, for example, a, you know, um, social media. This is not something that I grew up with, but I am learning from them. Um, I learn about newer um, technologies, newer things from, um, from my mentees. Um, one of my main, you know, one of my uh, mentees currently is very um, adept in meta-analysis, uh, statistical analysis. That's not something that I trained in, so um, I learned from him. So these are sessions that I set up, and it's 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 a mutual, and he's happy to to teach me about it while I discuss, you know, the ways that he can use his skills in building something. So it's 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 a two-way process always. And um, and I think it's the approachability, the uh, the friendliness, the, um, the you know making sure that um, everyone achieves their goals is you know that's what I see as as the uh, as the most important factors in the mentor mentee relationship. Uh, yeah, uh, very important words. I agree with you. And uh, but you you are also an educator. So what's the I mean, what's the line between the educator and mentor for you? Or is there any like uh, border? I think they merge at some point. I think it's it's a it's not like a, a clear you know like I guess you can you can um, you can search those words and I, I'm sure you will probably get different meanings, but they also used as synonyms. Um, but to me, an educator is somebody who kind of you know teaches um who gives in parts you know I, I see it more as an unilateral um uh, you know process whereas mentorship is a bilateral process it's a more um you know um you give feedback you know take back um input from 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 the mentees and then work towards you work together whereas educator is like you know it's a you know you you, you do a presentation um and and then of course it's always you know interactive at the end, but it's like mostly one directional. Uh, but what's the I mean how it looks like the medical education now, and uh, what do you think about the medical education? Let's say in ten years, twenty years, or even more, is it going to be? And what is it about, in your opinion? It's so hard to keep up with so many things, right? I mean, it is really, um, 
the the science is advancing at such a rapid speed. We used to, when I was a fellow, uh, we used to have sessions, core lectures, um, you know, one day dedicated to um, to lung cancer. And we had ample time for questions and maybe do other things as well along the way. But now, you know, like just to discuss targeted therapies, perhaps I need at least two sessions to do a decent job, um, you know, like, and I can spend an entire hour just talking about, let's say, KRAS mutation or EGFRX on 20. So the, the, it, it's it's an evolving field. It really depends on the audience who I'm trying to teach. If it's a medical student, you know the the the, the discussion is very different than if it is a, if it's a fellow uh, when it, the discussion is going to be much more in depth. So I think the education needs to be tailored to the needs of the the audience um, and their level of understanding. But at the same time, uh, you know, like. It, it, there's so much to discuss. There's so much to talk about. So uh, constant education, continuous. Uh, that's why I think these online um, virtual uh, platforms are extremely important. Um, also important are the social media where you get like bullets for, you know, like it, uh, just past weekend, there was GI um, ASCO and I, I don't treat GI cancers, but I learned so much from them. So, you know, it was important for me to get on Twitter just to see those little bullets, you know, that people had put in to, to learn about. So, it never ends. Education never ends for me. It comes in various different sources. I, you know, I, 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 you know, it's almost like a sponge that you want to absorb everything that comes at you and and try to retain and so that that you can um, build on that when you're doing your own research. Uh, coming to to the research, and um, you said when you were in India, you were very active in the clinical field, but research somehow was the, the thing which was lacking. And um, in the United States, there were a lot of opportunities for research. So uh, as it is in many developing countries, research usually is considered luxury, right? And usually what we are lacking there. Um, and when I, I, I see your bio and I read about you, uh, I came across that you are involved in health disparities, you are involved uh, in mentorship and, and some narrow professional fields. So was that the reason, because back in the career, in the beginning of your career, you did not have the opportunity uh, of doing research, or I mean, you have uh, ob you, uh, you observed the disparities between the uh, developed and developing countries. Was that the reason that you chose these directions for your further concentration? Uh, I would say, um, uh, yes, that laid the foundation for sure, for sure. Uh, at the places that I worked, even in India, I, I want to just um, say that even in India, I was able to do some research, but it was clinical. It was clinical. And the methodology was um, was kind of, you know, like, again, like you said, it's a luxury. So you had to go looking for people who, um, it was not easy to find people who, who would uh, be willing to work or who had the ability to to provide the guidance. Things are very different in India now. I mean, at the, you know, like a lot of uh, publications that come out, uh, you know, even to the plenary session, I see that a lot of things have changed. So it is possible. It's not like it's not possible, but you know, um, uh, it, it was it was much more challenging there. But more importantly, I saw the disparity. We used to have I don't know how it is, you know, like now, but you know, at that time there used to be, you know, like there used to be deluxe rooms where they're individual, and then there used to be the general ward where people were just in one ward you know, just you know, like separated by maybe a curtain. That's a luxury sometimes, but ne sometimes not even that. Um, and, and, and I could see that, you know, it was, um, it was hard. I mean, some of these patients were, um, you know, um, immunologically suppressed and, um, and, and they were just right next to each other. And, and, you know, I could see that there was a difference in 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 the in their outcomes. Uh, it's not because the doctors were treating them differently, but it's just because of the nature of everything else that went on around around their um, uh, around their life cycle. There were not that many supporters. They were like the parents were there sometimes, but most of the time they were the, the children were by themselves. So that disparity, you know, came across very significantly even as I was um, training. 
But when I came here, I saw that, it, it, you know, I thought, you know, moving to a different country where there's so much, um, uh, you know, in terms of, in, in terms of um, uh, research, in terms of availability, uh, even in terms of, you know, how um, uh, clinical care is conducted. But I was really kind of, you know, surprised to see that the disparities are not unique to, um, you know, de developing countries. It's it's everywhere. Um, and it's even probably even more pronounced sometimes, I would think, that, you know, uh, uh, so... As I mentioned, I did work at Bellevue um, Medical Center for quite a bit, and um, I could see the the, the socioeconomic um, support that the, the patients had there was very different than uh, the patients at, um, at Tisch Hospital, which is, it, it's the same set of doctors, it's the same umbrella of NYU, but, you know, just, um, just a block away, you could see so much disparity in, in how the patients responded to treatment, how the patients received treatment or how they were accepting of treatment. And, and uh, it, it's just a, a very, very uh, interesting and, um, area of, of work. And I, I think we're, you know, we focus on race, gender, um, a few other things, but there's so much in terms of in, when you talk about disparities, disparities are there in many, many other domains. And I think it's an evolving field. Yeah, that, that's very true. And one of the, like, like your research uh, interests are also immunotherapy and, and precision medicine. And I think especially in, in those fields, the disparities are even more pronounced or more profound, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The more advanced the um, the treatment, the more disparities you would find because, um, because you know the, the the treatment can be very simplistic, but it can also be very complicated based on genomic um, information, the immuno profile information. Um, but you can you know like. You can you still see that NGS. I mean, even there was there have been several papers showing that next generation sequencing is you know there's so much disparity in African American and uh, Hispanic populations. Uh, by the way, you you mentioned uh, New York University and uh, it's the 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 one with Langone Health, right? It's now yeah Langone, correct. I, I was yeah. reading the book. Uh, it's about the changes over the past, I think already 12, 13 years. And this was very impressive. There was a book which I bought from the airport and I, I like to buy the books from the air, these books from the airports. It was called, it's called World Class. Very impressive book, how the, how the New York University School of Medicine uh, made this huge development over the, over the decade. I think it was very impressive, at least for me. Uh, and yeah, yeah, please. Oh, no, no. Yes. I mean, I was um, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, I had, I, I witnessed that transformation. They went from, um, you know, um, from a non-NCI -NC designated to an NCI designated center. And, um, you know, there's a huge um, uh, momentum to, to do, um, you know, translational and basic science. It was there already, but then the momentum kind of, you know, took off. Uh, over the last decade, and there was there's been a lot of philanthropic funding to support that you know um, process as well. Yeah, very nice. Uh, what is it for you to be an oncologist? So, uh, you know, ask myself that question a lot of times. What does it mean um, to be an oncologist? You know, it's um, I th think it's an honor. It's an honor to be an oncologist. It's um, you know, it's, uh, it's that patients actually give their lives and we become part of their lives. Um, it's um, it's kind of a combination of, and I wouldn't call um, it, you know, like as comprehensive as primary care. It's, it's um, you know, specialized, but we do follow patients regularly. They identify as as some, someone, if something happens, we are the first people to for them to call. Um, they come here with a smile. They greet. I know about my patients. I know about their families. I know, you know, if they go on vacation, they're sure to, you know, um, come and talk about it. Shows to share some pictures. They feel so comfortable that they are, you know, in 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 the company of um, someone that they um, uh, that um, that they can treat as a friend, let's say. But they also know that I'm a partner. 
I am um, the one that's you know helping them get better. Um, so it's it's an honor to be um, to be part of this. And and a lot of times patients do very well. You know, we used to talk about, and I've been, in, you know, going through this for for the last, you know, uh, couple of decades, and I see how the treat how the treatments have advanced. Now, before, um, I, I I didn't have the luxury of having patients, uh, you know, be with me for uh, for a long period of time. But now, five years, six years, they still come. They want to come. They it's 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 like they're, you know, um, a milestone that they've achieved. So when they come to an oncologist's office, it's it's with pride that they come and. and and, and they say, this is my fifth year since I was diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer, you know, and I did all these things, you know, I attended, you know, someone's wedding, I, you know, I saw, you know, five grandchildren graduate, it, it's, it's every time that they come, it's, uh, so, so being part of that process, being part of that, you know, like, um, success stories is extremely rewarding. But it's not always the case. We also see that patients, some patients don't do well. And, you know, it's a, uh, and then it, uh, it, my role becomes really important to kind of comfort them, get them through the transition um, process from, um, you know, go, go on to the next, you know, phase of their, you know, journey um, as they um, pass. And um, I also support the family members. So it's very gratifying to, um, to have family members call, you know, um, a year or two later, just to check in to see if I am doing okay, you know, and, 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 and it's, it's a, it's a lovely process. I think, you know, a relationship that we develop um, with patients. So I, I consider it an honor. Uh, what's the future of oncology in your opinion in 10 years? 20 years. Yeah, it's yes. hard to predict. I think I, I don't know if I can even predict 10 months from now because the advances are so rapid. <laughs> but I think it is going to um, hopefully be very, very personalized. Uh, everyone is different. Uh, we, are, we are a heterogeneous um, you know, um, population of individuals. So uh, one size does not fit all of us. So I think I hope that it's going to be very personalized. And, you know, there will be... Um, hopefully a, a very um, a co uh, collaborative uh, um, uh, collaborative uh, uh, influence uh, with AI, uh, which I think is probably going to hopefully just help us not take over, but help mm -hmm. us, you know, get to where, <laughs> get to where we need to be uh, 10 years from now. Thank you very much. Um, it was really uh, extremely positive interview and if you have anything else to add, please, you are welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thanks, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much. It's really an honor and great pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Have a Good night. Day. Bye.